Hello and welcome to another episode of Free Mississippi. Today I'm talking to someone in lockdown London, Dominic Frisby. Dominic, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Douglas. Thank you very much for having me. I, I must say I was very surprised because it was kind of been more than about a month or two ago. We were sitting outside the tennis courts in Fulham um, doing an interview together and yearning to play tennis. And then lo and behold, I look on Twitter and you've suddenly gone to Mississippi and, and, and are saving the place. What, what, what happened there? Well, I let's put it this way. I didn't move to Mississippi because of my skills as a tennis player. Um, I, <laughs> I've started this role at the Mississippi Center for Public Policy, and um, I, I've been a long-time fan of America. When we were sitting there in London, we were both complaining about the state of the world, particularly the state of the world in London, where you have this incredibly restrictive lockdown, and where you have, um, you know, a, a, a arbitrary government and a fundamental lack of liberty. And you know, it seems to me that America is is the beacon of hope for people like us who believe in freedom. And if well, it, America... it's it's the greatest country on earth, Douglas. We all know that it is. And if American liberty falls, the world is lost. So I think so. One of the things I've always admired about America, and probably one of the reasons it's been so successful, is is its system of states. Now, for example, if there's something in London that you don't like. You can't move to Surrey or move to Cornwall because the law changes there. It's pretty much the same law wherever you go. Whereas because so much law and tax and everything else is distributed from state to state, we can all do what Elon Musk has done. And if we don't like California, yeah. we can go to Texas or Absolutely. hopefully Mississippi. Absolutely. And this is what we want to do. We want to make people come to Mississippi. The danger is, of course, that you have a federal government now that is controlled by the same sort of people who've made a complete mess of California and New York State, and they try and make the other 49 states like California. You see the Californization of the United States, but you're absolutely right. One of the things that really excites me about this role here in Mississippi is precisely because of that, the, the, the Tenth Amendment, which allows states to do their own thing. And I think that is, that is where the conservative movement, the freedom movement, needs to needs to now um, respond. That's that should be. It does because if one state gets something right, then all the other states will copy it. It's a sort of virtuous circle. Absolutely, and you understand this brilliantly. And I wanted to come on to talk about your book, but if I could sort of segue into that by by talking about the very fact that here in Mississippi, we are trying to set the example by abolishing income tax, abolishing the state income tax. Now, if we can do that, other states will have to follow suit. And I think- what is, what is the state income tax in Mississippi? What percentage is it? Well, for every $20 you earn, you've got to give $1 to um, the state government. It's about 5%, but that's on top- And what is federal of... income tax? Oh, too much. I mean, it's, it's, it's not as high as in the UK, um, but you are, you are, you know, you're, you're handing over a large chunk of your, in total, you're probably handing over you know, slightly over 30 percent of your 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 wage packet to. OK, so state income, federal income tax is much higher than local. Yeah, yeah, it is. OK, it is. but even I, so, what I mean, one of the great, for me, one of the great tragedies of the American system is the passage in 1913 of a constitutional amendment that allows the feds to collect a federal income tax. And I, I, I really do think that is that is where the seeds of the corruption of the Republic <laughs> were sown. Um, but, well, you know, actually, Douglas, it, it, the very first income tax in America it didn't last that long, but it was in the um, American Civil War. Abraham Lincoln, uh, as well as <laughs> as well as founding the IRS, that great institution, Abraham Lincoln also gave America its first income tax only temporarily. And he also gave America that thing where if you were no matter where you go in the world, you still have to pay your taxes to the United States unless you renounce your American citizenship. Abraham Lincoln did that because he was trying to protect uh, revenue, his revenue during the American Civil War. And it's one of those things, you make a law and it never changes. It, it's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? That sort of imperial ambition of the IRS where they regard anyone <laughs> of American citizenship earning anything anywhere in the world as um, right for fleecing. Um, but I mean, I want uh, taxes to talk... are the price we pay for a civilized society, Douglas. <laughs> I'm sure that's what they say. But um, similarly... it's inscribed on the building. Yeah. If if taxes become too high, civilized society begins to disintegrate. Um, 
or you get this absurd situation where the, the state doesn't even bother taxing you. It just it just basically prints money, which is the ultimate form of taxation and civilization a la, a la, um, um, Venezuela falls apart. But listen, I wanted for the benefit of our viewers to talk to them about, I mean, you're a comedian, you're a stand up comedian first. And like many of the great advocates for conservative ideas, you're not necessarily a, 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 a kind of party member in the sense you probably wouldn't be a member of the Republican party yet. But like Joe Rogan and, and, and some of those great um, um, figureheads for the conservative movement here on, on new media, you're a stand-up comic who also happens to have a pretty conservative free market view of the world. You have also written a number of books and produced some really excellent music videos. Um, but I really wanted to talk to you today about your new book, which is released in America, and it's um, called Daylight Robbery. Tell us a bit about it, please. Yeah, well, Daylight Robbery comes out in America this week, and, and you're absolutely right. I am a, My background is as a stand-up comic, and a lot of people think that qualifies me not to talk about finance but I would argue it's actually the other way round because comedy instills the discipline of clarity onto the performer if the audience isn't under, able to understand what you're talking about they don't laugh and the comedian dies and so I, I like to think I've taken that discipline of clarity and done the opposite of what Alan Greenspan used to do all that what he used to call purposeful obfuscation where he was deliberately vague in everything he used to say and brought the discipline of clarity to my financial writing. And the central thesis of this book, I used to think that, and I still do to a certain extent, think that a large percentage of the Western world's woes go back to its system of money. And if we had an independent system of money, such as gold or Bitcoin or whatever it is, that governments didn't have the power to print, then that would force much more discipline onto governments and it would make them less able to spread into, into our lives as they do and overstep what their remit is. Just for the, um, benefit, for the benefit of viewers, am I right in thinking that this idea that you have a currency that is for central banks and politicians to manipulate, it's actually quite new. It's only since 1971 that the dollar and sterling and Western currencies have become this sort of plaything of politicians. Before then, there was a restriction and a restraint on them, wasn't there? There was. Um, 1971 was the year that America abandoned the gold standard in order to, um, because basically it was printing more money than it had gold to back it and it had all its Vietnam war to pay for and all I President mean, LBJ's, various... LBJ's, LBJ's big society was paying for. <laughs> that too. I was just coming to that. Um, the UK and Germany and France, we all abandoned our gold standard in 1914 because we had a war to pay for. The, the great irony of that is if we'd stayed on the gold standard, there was not the gold to pay for the World War One to go on for the length that it did. And millions and millions and millions, hundreds of millions of lives even, would have been saved if we'd simply stuck to the discipline of gold. But unfortunately, politicians knew better. They always do. Now, um, But coming, coming back to daylight robbery, so I, I went one stage further. I've got this theory that tax is, tax is power whether it's king or government or emperor, if they lose their tax revenue, they lose their power. And you design a society by the way that you tax it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you determine whether the people are going to be free or subordinated, prosperous or poor, simply by the extent to which you tax them and also the means by which you tax them, whether you tax labour or sales or land or whatever it is you choose to tax. And then I sort of expanded on that and I started to think about the fact that there has never been, like I sort of dream of an anarcho-capitalist society where there's no taxation. But the reality of history, the evidence of history, is that there has never been a society without taxation of some kind. There have been societies where taxation was voluntary, ancient Athens, but taxation has always existed right back to ancient Mesopotamia. And in all likelihood, this idea of a sense of duty to the greater collective will have existed even in the hunter-gatherer societies that predated civilization. So tax is part of our lives. And then there's the great Benjamin Franklin quote about you know, the two inevitabilities, death and taxation. And actually, it's a little known fact, everyone thinks Benjamin Franklin said that, but that was actually first said by a comedian. <laughs> in a farce of 1716 called The Cobbler of Preston by a chap called Christopher Bullock. The impossible, tis impossible to be sure of anything but death and taxes. And it was probably a fairly common saying in those days because 
you know, Franklin obviously, obviously said it about 50 years later. Bren Benjamin Franklin, among other things, was a brilliant satirist. And he wrote these, this wonderful com this um, column, a bit like Titania McGrath today on Twitter, if you follow her or him, um, you know, pretending to be this really woke warrior, but in fact making quite conservative arguments. Mm -hmm. Benjamin Franklin gave, used to write this guide to the English what to do if they want to subordinate the Americans. And basically all the things he told them to do, the English did. <laughs> and the Americans, of course, didn't want it. And so we got no taxation without representation and, and the great American revolution. And that's one example of many examples through history of, I was saying, you know, tax is part of our lives, tax is inevitable. If you start looking at history through this prism of taxation, you realize that every great event would not have occurred in the same way were it not for tax, take taxation of some kind. Every war is funded by some kind of taxation. Every um, revolution, every revolt is some kind of revolt against some kind of economic in inequity perpetrated by the tax system, by the, by the, because tax is control. Every conquest is about taking control of the tax base, the land, the labor, the produce, the, prof uh, the profits. And then even things like the birth of Christ, Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem to pay taxes. Otherwise they would never have been in Bethlehem and Christianity would never have evolved Absolutely. in the same way. The, the crime for which Christ was crucified was forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. Again, it was a tax crime. And then you suddenly realize first men on the moon, tax got them there. It, everything involves taxation in some kind of way. As you, as you start to look at history through the prism of taxation, certainly you can see the American revolution as a revolt against paying taxes. But you use the phrase no taxation without representation. I think I'm right in saying that was also a cry used during the English Civil War by uh, uh, the parliamentarians like John Hamden. That was a, a tax revolt, a revolt against ship money. The French Revolution famously was a tax revolt. So um, do you think that basically this relationship between elites trying to work out how to fleece the productive and the productive deciding whether or not to put up with it. This is a key driver of historic events. Uh, absolutely. It's the, it's the same dynamic. It's this dance that seems to have gone on for all eternity between those who would control <laughs> and those who would be free. Those who would create and innovate and, and invent and, and explore and those who would tell them that they can't, that can't be done. Now, here in Mississippi, as I was saying, we are starting this campaign, and there are others who've waded in. Um, Grover Norquist from the uh, Americans for Tax Reform weighed in um, this week with a brilliant article saying that, yes, Mississippi needs to get rid of its income tax. We are working on a roadmap to work out how that could be done. It would mean that we'd need to find about 35% of revenue from other sources, but we think that that is perfectly feasible and perfectly possible. Um, when 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 you when you think of taxes, what taxes do you think you should prioritize getting rid of? Would income tax? I mean, income tax I think is an attractive one to get rid of because you instantly make it worth people's more 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 worthwhile to go and work. If you tax people's pay paycheck, um, they keep less of their money. If you remove that impediment, suddenly you create this incentive for people who aren't working to go and work. What other things do you think? What other taxes do you think? we should get rid of, and how should we raise the money that you clearly need to do some things collectively? Well, the, um, I, I'm not, I must confess, Douglas, and forgive me, dear listener, I'm not that familiar with Mississippi tax policy, so I don't know which taxes you I'm have and which you I'm don't. I'm failing in my duties, I'm failing in my job. But I mean, you've got, but you've I got, do, you've got some taxes on consumption, you could, you could tax people by putting money on, on what they call gas here, they mean, they mean petrol, um, you could tax consumption, you could tax property. Um, I mean, it seems to me that taxing income is particularly daft because if you tax something, you tend to get less of it. Um, and if you, so if you, tax, if you tax income, you have lower incomes. Um, well, I, would, I, I agree, Douglas. I think taxing income, I think a labourer's labour should be his to own. I think taxing income is one of the great evils of the modern world. The left say we need to tax income because we need to equalize life chances. But in fact, if you tax labor, you make the world more unequal. 
And income tax is one of the reasons why there's this huge divide between generations, because the young person starting out in life, all he has is his labor. He has nothing else. The, and if you think of the super rich, they did not get rich by working but through their labor, they got rich through the appreciation of their assets, their houses, their land, their companies, um, their fine art, all those things, which for the most part go untaxed. So you have one group, the elder generation, who, who are asset rich and largely go untaxed. They don't rely on their income. And you have the younger group that's trying to catch them up, but is constantly having their, their, their means to do that chipped away at them. In addition to that, and there's not a lot that Mississippi can do about this, the money that they're being paid in is losing its value every year because so much of it is being printed. And so meanwhile, printing money boosts asset price inflation. So again, the money these people are receiving for their labor, um, excuse me, I just got cut off there for a moment. The two combined actually cause inequality. Mm -hmm. And what the left always fails to do, they say we can't reduce income tax because that creates inequality. They fail to distinguish between income and wealth. They're two very different things. The, in answer to what Mississippi should do, I'm a big believer that lower taxes lead to greater revenue. So I would subscribe to the Milton Friedman thing of taxing every, getting rid of every possible tax that you can, um, in, any, in every way, shape or form. The one um, tax that Milton Friedman sort of approved of would be land value tax, but I wouldn't propose introducing that because the point of land value tax is that it replaces other taxes. Um, you, it shouldn't be in addition to other taxes, but that's what I would advocate. Well, um, are, you, are you following, Douglas, the work that Florida is doing at the moment with regard to taxes? It's trying to turn itself into a sort of Bitcoin cryptocurrency center. The, the Miami's actually buying cryptocurrencies, I understand, and there's all sorts of pro cryptocurrency regulation in place. Is that something you're following? I, I'm looking at it, but if, you know, please do, what, what do you think is so attractive about it? Who's, who's the brains behind it? Is this the mayor of Miami? I think he's one of the brains. I think he's trying to put 1% of Miami's treasury into Bitcoin, mm -hmm. but the, I, I just know that, you know, cryptocurrency the crypto economy there's again it's split it divides people there are those that say it's never going to work it's a bubble and all those things but i think you know 11 or 12 years on it's pretty clear it's here to stay and it's the most tremendous technological opportunity uh, in the world at the moment it's sort of a part akin to what the internet was in the 1990s mm -hmm. and it's a place of extraordinary innovation experiment ex experimentation and wealth creation and all the bitcoiners at the moment or a great deal of the american based ones are moving to florida and they they're trying to they're doing that and i know that the tax laws favor them so whatever they're doing maybe it's worth mississippi copying that we, well we're actually launching a, a tech center here fairly soon so a tech and innovation center i i think that's something we need to look at i, I don't to be honest i don't know a great deal about it but I think that's something we need to look at. Um, look, look at, follow a guy called Michael Saylor. He's one of the sort of most vocal Bitcoin cheerleaders at the moment. He's based in Miami. And another guy called Anthony Pompliano, who's based in Miami, another Bitcoin cheerleader. And they, they all seem to be, him, them and the mayor, they all seem to be doing it together. You know, he's taking advice from them. It's interesting, earlier on, you were sort of asking me, you know, how come I moved to America and why America? You know, why the South? I think this really interesting phenomenon that you sort of alluded to is, is going on in the United States. Traditionally, big business hubs were in the Northeast, Chicago, California. Because of high tax and regulation um, regimes in those states, you're seeing businesses relocating. You, 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 every day you hear of a business moving out of um, traditional business hubs and coming to Texas, coming to Florida, coming to Tennessee. Texas is to our left, Florida is to our right, Tennessee is just above us. I really, really, really see part of our mission here at the Mississippi Center for Public Policy is to make Mississippi a competitive place for businesses to want to come and, and grow. Um, you know, you've got the perfect it's got to be. It's got to be a huge opportunity. Like Texas and Florida are the most traveled to, like everyone is moving to Texas and Florida. If real estate's cheap in Mississippi. We're slap bang in the middle. And you know, the, the food is brilliant. The people are wonderful. The weather is gorgeous. 
um, I, I've sort of been going around here in the past month or so since I've been here in the sort of days of thinking, you know, why why didn't I do this before? It's it's the most amazing place, and I I, I want to come. I do do honestly. Um, I What's the capital of Mississippi? Jackson, named after the uh, the, the President Andrew Jackson. Um, and um, we've got a, a beautiful coast to the south with Ocean Springs and Biloxi and some beautiful places. We've got the Delta, which is the home of American music. And, you know, Mississippi State itself, geographically, is about the size of England. Um, and yet the population is nothing like as big as England. So, you know, here I am in the capital of Mississippi, and you've got a beautiful city with lots of space, lots of parkland, lots of gardens. It's, it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's just gorgeous. It's, it's like- Do you get hurricanes and floods and things? You, the, the Mississippi does periodically flood. And um, there were some really big floods in the sort of 1920s and periodically, you know, people do, do things to try to um, avert that and limit it. But, you know, fundamentally the, the Mississippi will flood from time to time. You get, and of course, Katrina, um, New Orleans, which is due south of here, got really, I mean, Katrina was just off, off the charts in terms of the, the ferociousness of that hurricane, and that devastated the south coast. Um, but, you know, the wonderful thing about Americans is they have this great, upbeat, optimistic, confident spirit. And so, you know, they, they rebuild. And they, I know it's a cliche used with regard to COVID, this idea of build back better, but they really do. And the, the, the south coast, which was devastated by Katrina, is now you know absolutely booming um and you know they they have this can-do attitude it's, it's wonderful it's wonderful to see and what what can you how what are the chances of expanding the airport to make it more of an international airport hey that that would be that would be wonderful i mean i think in this day and age you, you have to have good air travel um i mean even before we get to that stage i think a state like mississippi has to think about basic things like like roads um in the 1980s there was a, a highway building program and that was funded in part by putting tax on on gas petrol um, i think people need to think seriously about how to recalibrate the tax system if you're going to get rid of income tax you know should you be doing that by uh, reducing tax on income as other revenue streams grow it seems logical to me that if you're going to invest in building proper road infrastructure a good way of I would have thought a good way of funding that might be through a tax on, on, on gas, generally, because the more you use the roads, the more gas you use. Yeah. And the other ways of doing it. Um, and, you know, other, other countries and other states have, you know, you know, you have toll systems and, and what have you. But yeah, I mean, infrastructure is important. I mean, there are things that a state government ought to do and getting good infrastructure is one of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you need in this world, in this COVID world, you need good internet yeah. and cheap real estate. Well, on that note, we in Mississippi have been given a sizable grant of money by the feds to develop broadband. And you're right, if you're not connected to broadband properly, um, you know, you, 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 you're, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're, you're not in the conversation, you're, you're economically disadvantaged. The problem is that if you get a large pot of public money, how do you make sure that it's spent wisely? And that's something we're looking into because to be blunt about it, some of the way that that broadband money has been spent has not been in the best interests of the householders and the, the consumer. Um, it's often spent in the interests of the people who have a well, who have a vested interest in spending it the way they, they see fit. So that is a huge issue. And is Mississippi a red state or a blue state? I mean, the Republicans today kind of run all of, I think, all eight of the, all eight offices that are elected on pan-state basis are Republican. But it's 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 slightly deceptive. It was you know it's been Democrat historically since the pretty much since the Civil War, and it's it's flipped and it's flipped really quite recently. I met, uh, for example, the State Attorney General, and she's not only the first woman State Attorney General; she's the first Republican State Attorney General, I think, since eighteen seventy something. So you know it it it, it looks solidly Republican, but actually it's it's a very complicated local state dynamic. Um, I see. Is it part of the sort of the working class that used to be represented by the left now feeling more represented by the right? It, it's classic what you might have called Reagan Democrat country. Previously, people who historically voted Democrat and lent their votes to the Republican and have now kind of flipped to the Republicans. Absolutely. Very, very much so. Very much so. so. 
Shall I tell you a little story about, um, I was saying how taxation has impacted our lives in all sorts of weird and wonderful and unexpected ways. Um, and, you know, when I talked about the birth of Christ, the first men on the moon, every war, um, I'll tell you how Jackson, why Jackson is called Jackson. And that is because we only started using surnames in the 12th, 13th and 14th centuries uh, in order to identify people for, for tax purposes, specifically poll taxes. Really? And so you would identify, identify Jack either by, the, by his job. So he'd be Jack the Smith or Jack the Tyler or Jack the Gardener or whatever it is, hence Jack Gardener. Or you'd identify, identify Jack by some geographical, prominent geographical location where he lived, Jack by the hill, Jack Hill, Jack um, Ford, whatever it was, or by some prominent feature. So for example, Ken, uh, Cameron, I think means crooked nose and uh, <laughs> Kennedy means shaggy hair or shaggy head. I or, don't think course, anyone will call me that. <laughs> you should, yeah. Or you should, or, or you would identify someone just simply by who his dad was. Yeah. So Jack would be Jackson. Really? Or, or and Mac and Macmillan or O, you know, they're all different ways of, of identifying parentage. So, and that's why we have surnames, and that's why Jackson is called Jackson. Surnames, tax came, collection. surnames came along to allow people to tax us. Precisely. Otherwise, you'd just be Douglas. <laughs> or Douglasson, yeah. Or Douglas Kennedy, given my hairline. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> Interesting it, fact, no, no. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's 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 very interesting how so much that we take for granted about the modern world is driven by this dynamic of how governments are going to transfer resources from from us to to to, to them. Yeah, Even something like handwriting, the mm -hmm. very first forms of money we use were obviously bits of gold and silver and maybe copper and mm -hmm. um, uh, nickel, but also were in ancient Mesopotamia they would use bits of mud to record debts. And so a disc would represent a, a sheep and a cone would represent a bit of barley. And they baked these tokens inside clay balls. And then when the debt was settled, they'd smash open the clay ball. And then they quickly found it was actually easier to inscribe the clay with pictures instead. Uh, and that's how we developed the first systems of writing, the first hieroglyphs. This but the most common debt that was owed was taxes. So tax, it's a taxation story even behind the first writing. So you're saying that early primitive writing in Mesopotamia is developed as a system of record keeping. You know, farmer, this farmer here has given me grain or owes me this chunk of his grain. The very first examples we have of handwriting are tax records. What a depressing thought. <laughs> and if you think about it, it is depressing. And it's one of the reasons why so many have lasted for so long by the way in those days people didn't handle money in the way that we do now they just it wasn't coin wasn't it coin coinage hasn't even been invented um but so your taxes would be paid with a share of your produce or a share of your labor you'd go and you know it was right. taken in kind but even so like historians when they're trying to learn about a society one of the first things they look at is is the tax records, partly because you learn about a society by the way they tax people, but also because the tax records tend to be the best preserved documents of all because they were made for that very specific reason. They were of the Rosetta Stone, you know, like the oldest, one of the oldest documents written in three languages. It was a tax record. It was a tax document. <laughs> what a I was hoping you might say the first writing was a you know, a, a love sonnet or something, but no. It, it wasn't was, poetry, uh, taxi, it was mate. <laughs> now, now, you're in London. Um, what's it like in lockdown London? Because here in Mississippi, you know, um, people are being careful, but there simply aren't, the, the, the officialdom simply doesn't have the ability to tell people what to do the way they do in London. How, how is lockdown London? What, 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 what sort of, how restricted? Well, it's, it's, I mean, very few people, I, 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 I'm a writer, so I work from home, Douglas, and I sort of, I sort of do what I would do. It hasn't changed my life that much, except for the fact that there are no gigs, which is a sort of great loss. And I also narrate quite a few documentaries and things. And rather than go into a studio, I just do it from a, my studio. You can see I've got, I'm in my studio now talking to you. That's all the soundproofing on the wall there. 
it's hidden hidden from hidden from you that's the top of the so it, personally it, it hasn't impacted me that much yeah. but my eldest daughter is now 18 and she's in her final year of school and she's at home all day on her phone doing her schools over the phone and she's basically lost the last two years of her life my eldest son is at um uh university and he's just he, he lost his year off to lockdown and now he's lost his first year of university to it and my youngest son is just ut utterly miserable with it my youngest daughter's sort of okay um but children are using losing essential parts of their lives to this and because they're in the school system and the school like if i want to like disobey the rules i can and i get away with it but for kids in in the system yeah. it's it's very very hard for them um the i'm still ambivalent about the wisdom of lockdowns how how effective they are I, I you know i'm not an epidemiologist and i listen to one guy who's pro them talking and i think oh yeah you're right and then i listen to another guy who's anti them talking about them and I, I just I remain ambivalent but I do notice that London as a sort of capital city has a much more what's the word flamboyant less respectful attitude to the law so there's a, a few people aren't wearing masks and, and whatever and they're doing whatever they would do anyway you go to the countryside where people still trust what the government says and they think they're on on you know all wise and everything in the countryside, they're much, much more respectful about, you know, keeping their distance and so on. Mm -hmm. So London, there's kind of two sorts of some people who are respecting it and some people who aren't. But you go into central London and it is dead. You know, in the morning, you used to not be able to get on the tube. There'd be so many people on the tube. Now, if you get a tube in the morning, there are half as many tubes running and you get a seat every time. And probably there's a free seat on either side of you. It is dead. And, you know, I look at the stock market and you'd never know anything was wrong with the world, you know, because everything's going up. But it, the actual real economy, um, there's something very, very serious going on because anything that involves any kind of contact with anybody else has just ground to a halt. And I'm not quite sure where all this ends, but it's going to involve the word inflation. I'm sure of it. Well, one of the things that I find slightly bizarre about the UK situation, I'm looking at it as an outsider having left the UK, is just when you think they've got a strategy. So for example, they're gonna vaccinate, um, and um, once people are vaccinated, you reach a certain level, and then you, know, you, 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 you can relax the lockdown. They suddenly say, no, 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 no. we've got to keep the restrictions in case there's a variant. Um, and this reminds me of what happened last year when people said, we've got to impose the restrictions to build capacity in the NHS. And then gradually it morphed into uh, an excuse, not simply to try and allow time for extra NHS hospital capacity. The lockdown became, uh, 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 the, the excuse for the lockdown became to actually try and eradicate the virus. It seems to me that every time politicians take on these new restrictive powers, we, we allow them to do it because we think, right, it's for this purpose. But the purpose is, always extended and you know it, it would seem bizarre utterly bizarre if 70 percent of the population of the uk had the vaccine which i think you know could be done relatively quickly could be done by the summer but the restrictions still remained and yet that now seems to be the position i i heard a minister today saying that, that people won't be allowed any foreign travel until the rest of the world has been vaccinated i mean surely this is just nuts uh, it, uh, it really concerns me and you know they cheat cheat they keep changing the goalposts and they scared the living daylights out of everyone this time last year, rightly or wrongly, but the, the, the scary message got through. And so they were able to do what they wanted to do. But you wonder, did they really know what they were doing? Yeah. You know, and, and the fact that they keep, keep changing the goalposts make you wonder. And like I read the other day, we've got this new South African variant of the vaccine of, of the virus and the vaccination doesn't the Oxford vaccination doesn't protect you from the South African variant and therefore the whole that just means well what's the point of the vaccination then because we've just got a new one and at a certain point you'd like to think they just go do you know what we're just going to let everyone take their own decisions uh, uh, based on their own circumstances and that will result in a better overall outcome than one top-down directive but there's no chance of, of English government ever saying that 
And the great, I keep coming back to this book and taxation, but it's all in there, Douglas. The great evidence of history is that, and, and if you put taxation as a form of control, you know, you don't want people wearing beards, so you tax beards. That's what Peter the Great of Russia did. He wanted to make Russia more Western, and so he taxed beards. And in order to prove, if you had a beard and you hadn't paid the tax, you were forcibly shaven in public. And if you had to pay the tax, you had to hang a little token from your beard that said the beard is a superfluous burden. <laughs> but anyway, the so but you, so you use, you know, you don't want people to smoke or you don't want them to drive cars, so you tax tax these things. But the the evidence of history is, is when governments try and impose large scale new taxes in peacetime, they can't. Yeah. The, the, the population won't have it. And a great example of that in recent years is the poll tax brought down Margaret Thatcher, even though actually the poll tax was probably she was trying to bring greater accountability to local councils, but it backfired and the accountability for the excess charging fell on her. But, you know, and, you know, you look at Ed Miliband's mansion tax or George Osborne's pasty tax, they all backfired on them. Whereas, so you need some kind of crisis to impose the new taxation. And so, you know, the American Civil War gave America income tax, World War One gave us income tax, World War Two brought income tax to everyday Americans, the 1942 Revenue Act. Even after 1913, most Americans were out of the range of ordinary income taxes. The Revenue Act of 1942 came along to pay for the war. Donald Duck, uh, there was a propaganda fe video featuring Donald Duck being proud to pay his taxes. There was a song sung, an Irving Berlin song, which was, I paid my income tax today. A thousand planes to bomb Berlin, they'll all be paid for, and I chipped in. I paid my income tax today and was ever the link between war and tax more apparent. But, you know, without the emergency of Pearl Harbor and World War II, they, they would never, they would no, have no chance of getting income tax imposed. And yet, uh, to, uh, 2008, quantitative easing, another form of tax, taxation via inflation, if, you know, taxation without legislation, if you like but it's a means of transferring wealth from one place to another. They would never have been able to print money without the financial crisis, but they scare, everyone gets scared. They scare the living daylights out of everyone. And then they impose the new controls. And when the crisis has passed, the evidence of history is that the controls never go back to what they were before the crisis began. So World War II went away and ordinary income tax, Americans are still paying income tax. We got income tax for the first time in the UK in the Napoleonic Wars, and then it was taken away and put it again. But here we are 200 years later, we're still paying a temporary tax and, and, I, and quantitative easing. Oh, it'll only be a little bit after 2008. It just gets bigger every year. And so I don't think we're ever going to go back to what we knew. And I think that's a very sad fact, but even something like masks, you know, I find masks, I get both arguments. I get that you're protecting other people as well as yourself, but then I get the other argument that the virus is so small, it gets through the mask anyway, and you handle the mask. And so you end up spreading the virus. But, you know, I find them deeply antisocial because when you're, somebody's got a mask on and all you can see is their eyes, a, you can't hear what they're saying, and B, you don't know if that person's squinting at you aggressively or smiling, you can't tell. Yeah. So they're essentially an antisocial thing. And yet, I just think they are now part of our lives. I don't think, we're, we're, I think we're always gonna have to wear them on public transport. We're always gonna have to wear them on planes. And they're just part of our lives now. And I, I think that's very sad. I was hoping we'd finish on a positive note, but um, <laughs> I tell you what, Dominic, I, I think actually that in places like Mississippi, there's just not that deference to authority that, that, that you might get perhaps in, in, on the other side of the Atlantic. I mean, people here wear masks and there's a mask mandate, but you know, it's, it's, it's not enforced anything like it would be in London. There's not the, the, not the aggressive attempt to tell people what to do. It's, it's much more sort of advisory. And I think as a result of that, people here tend to, you know, they tend to take responsibility. People behave responsibly because they choose to. Um, I know there have been a couple of times when I've been here in meetings and it, people have said, you know, let's meet outdoors. And, you know, people, people make their own arrangements. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm an optimist. I, I, I still think that in the English speaking world, 
Um, the idea that you are responsible and that you should take responsibility and that you should live freely. I think that the, 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 the memory of that is still so fresh in people's minds. I, I don't think people will tolerate these um, temporary measures permanently. I, I, I really don't, I really don't. Um, well, I hope you're right. Yeah. The, the, I've never, I've always avoided the gun argument. I've, I've just avoided it because I, I've never quite understood it. But one thing I've thought of is, you know, in the 1500s, say the English Civil War or whatever it was, if you wanted to rebel against your leader or the Barons War, say, which gave us Magna Carta. And by the way, in the American Revolution, all the revolutionaries didn't think all that no taxation without representation. They didn't think they were fighting for new rights. They thought they were fighting to uphold rights that were enshrined mm -hmm. in Magna Carta, which was the result of another tax war. But anyway, but in those days, you know, if you wanted to, to fight the government over some kind of injustice, you know, the difference in arms between you with the stick, say, and the government with the sword, it wasn't, there wasn't such a mismatch. But in the UK, if we want to sort of rise up and revolt, the government's got guns and we don't. <laughs> Whereas in America, at least everyone's sort of reasonably equally armed. So again, it sort of en enables Americans to hold their leaders in check. That's one side of a much more complex and detailed argument with many other issues to it, by the way, but I mean, I, nevertheless. I, I, think, I think the, I think what keeps people free is the, the, the content of their minds rather than the content of their gun cabinet. I think the ability of people to have ideas and interact and exchange those ideas is what guarantees a, a free society. This is incidentally why I think you know, attempts by big tech to uh, manipulate um, public conversation and to um, prevent the democratization of opinion forming that the internet allows. That, I, I think that's incredibly worrisome um, because I, I think if you, if you, for example, put up with a big tech company um, preventing anyone from um, expressing opinions online and, pop, and, and, and promoting ideas that perhaps vaccines may or may not be as effective as, 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 as I think they actually are. If, if, you, if you allow big tech companies to, as an expediency, impose that kind of restriction in an emergency, the danger is that once the emergency is passed, you will live in a world where certain opinions and certain interpretations of current affairs are just verboten online. And that I think is very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. I, Extremely. I, I wonder what the Brexit referendum result or the, the months leading up to the Brexit referendum results would have been like if Facebook and co had been aggressively suppressing um, the kinds of opinions um, that were necessary to, to propagate. And, in they, I, won, I wonder about that. I think most people knew how they were going to vote. I, I, want, I bet it was only about five or ten percent of people made up their minds in the last few weeks. Yeah, yeah. But I do wonder about that. I mean, you wonder about the impact of social media, all the social media bans on the last election in America. Yeah. Um, the, it certainly is concerning that certain voices are being suppressed. It's like, you know, Facebook and, Tw and YouTube and all the rest of it, they were really proud of the fact that they were giving everyone, they were democratizing the media and everyone has a voice. And then they kind of looked at it and went, oh, actually, some of your voices we don't like. We don't like the deplorables, we better, we better shut them up. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I look at my own social media accounts and clearly someone somewhere um, has set up an algorithm that manipulates it in a way that just wasn't happening before. And, you know, it just, it just, it just kind of, um, I mean, I think ultimately, the good thing is, I think ultimately, if they do this and persist with this, they will turn their social media platforms into penny stock junk. junk. Um, they will, because that what, what we, by the way, another little interesting thing, in, in uh, ancient Rome, the censor uh, was responsible for maintaining public morality. He was also the tax collector. Ah, so could you be taxed and, uh, moral? Well, it, there, uh, there's always this moral thing. And of course, we have the word census, which derives from sense of the same word. But a census is, a, is, again, for the purposes of collecting taxes. So there is this relationship between freedom and, and, uh, and taxation of free speech and taxation. There's, there's a big crossover between the two. And, and in fact, Thatcher used to say you can't have freedom without economic freedom. And 
you can measure the freedom of a society by the extent to which it's taxed. Yeah. And I do think if you want free speech and free movement and free trade and free thought and free minds, you've got to have free markets as well. And that means low taxes. That is absolutely what the Mississippi Centre for Public Policy is, is trying to ensure. Absolutely. Freedom. Listen, Dominic, um, it's been wonderful talking to you. Your book is just out now. I'm going to have a couple of links to it. If people watching this want to find out more about the history of taxation and how the relationship between the, the, the tax and the tax collecting has shaped history, where, where should they go? Is there a particular, is there? Is it... Well, you could, I, I would advise, if you like the sound of my voice, <laughs> some people do and some people don't, I would advise going for the audio book uh, which you can get on Audible or iTunes or wherever, um, or you can just buy the book, um, you know, through Amazon or whatever your bookseller is. You might, if you go to your local bookshop, you might have to order it, um, but it's definitely on Amazon. And like it comes out in America this week. And not only do we cover the history of taxation, once you start to look at, we, I look at the future because once you look at the world through this prism of taxation, Mm -hmm. It starts to become clear why things are as they are, why things happened as they did, why things are as they are now, but also what's going to happen in the future. And I spend the last third of the book talking about, you know, the future of society and the future of taxation. And thank you very much for having me, Douglas. I hope your listeners and viewers will, will find it interesting. Wonderful. Dominic, lovely to see you and um, all the best. And um I hope to see you soon when lockdown restrictions are lifted and you can come to visit us in America. I'd love that. And we'll have a game of tennis. Wonderful. All the best. <laughs> Cheers.